Thank you, Jeff. It's a great pleasure to uh, appear to give this talk uh, because the IGS products do play a very critical role in the plate boundary observatory analysis. And at the same time, they also point out some of the limitations with the IGS products, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to start by reviewing the mouse shows up eventually, doesn't it? Yeah, by starting just to review the Plate Boundary Observatory. It's uh, part of an NSF uh, NASA funded program at the, um, funded out of the National Science Foundation and processed through the uh, UNAVCO gauge facility. And there are two uh, analysis methods, two groups that process data, one from the New Mexico Tech Institute of Technology, which uses the gamut uh, software, which is a conventional double differenced network processing software. The other is from the Central Washington University, and it uses Gypsy in a precise point positioning mode. And we combine those two together. And this is becoming a more common approach of, and it's a basic model of uh, the IGS itself, which is that combining individual analyses, the combination does seem to be of higher quality than the individual contributions despite the fact that statistically that's not necessarily what you might expect to happen. And we find that with um, gauge as well, is that the combination of the point positioning with the double difference processing in general is of higher quality than each of the individual solutions, but there are some subtleties in that combination. And I'm going to focus on a couple of those. And one is the impact on scale changes. And this is more generally an impact of when you do PPP of the inferred quality of network averaged quantities. And we'll find that PPP, because of its basic assumptions, has an impact on that. And we'll find that for the network processing, when you're doing regional networks, that there is an issue with the edges of the network and the quality of the clock information you infer because you have stations from an individual region. And we'll show a sort of a new application of the IGS type of products, the Sinex files, that we think actually might relieve and resolve some of the issues associated with that. Much of what I'm going to talk about is described in a paper uh, published in the reviews of geophysics last year by the group that does the analysis uh, of the gauge data, and I highly recommend that you um, look at that paper. It's published as open access so everybody can see it. So just to give you an idea of the gauge processing system, we actually process on multiple timescales, very similar. In fact, the timescales are based on the um, timescales of the IGS processing. And we have a rapid solution that happens in one day, uses IGS rapid orbits for the NMT solution. Uh, we have a final solution that runs, again, tagged on the IGS final orbit development, two to three week latency. We also have supplemental solutions that run 12 and 24 weeks behind time. They are small numbers of stations that are added to the final solution. And the idea of that analysis is to pick up stations with low latency. We also do reprocessing runs, and the next big reprocessing run we will do is associated with the transition to the ITF 2014 IGS 14 system. All the products that we generate are publicly available through the uh, uh, UNAVCO through a series of either HTTP, FTP, or PHP uh, processes, web services um, are being developed to do this, and you can get time series in a North America fixed frame. And again, that frame is very highly dependent on the IGS in its definition uh, and through its, uh, the ITRF combination. Uh, we look at select, we do select secular velocity fields. Uh, those are now produced monthly across the whole network. Uh, we generate Sinex files with full variance covariance matrices, which are available. And we have event files for earthquakes. Uh, when you see the number of stations we process for the duration, we have something like about 40 to 45 earthquakes that we need to account for. We have atmospheric delay estimates, phase RMS qualities, and other quality metrics, uh, some of which, which are produced by Jeff Fluitt's group at UNR. There's also lots of tools that are available uh, for looking at these data, and this is the network. Um, so this is the network here, and you can actually go to this URL uh, to be able to actually download and view this file. This is, um, uh, decimated out somewhat because of the density of the stations in there. And um, so we have tools that we can use to look at this. We also have characterization of the uh, quality of the data. 
And here what we're trying to sense, this is the whole network we process. It's approximately uh, 1,800 stations on any one day. Uh, but over a uh, period of the 20 years of data that we have, we have an accumulated number of almost two, over 2,000 stations that we have. And one of the things we characterize here is what is the level of correlated noise in the time series? And we do that through uh, use of um, a random walk statistic. And so to give you some indications of what data looks like here, this is a station which is sort of in the uh, desert part of the US. Uh, you can see the RMS in this case is about 0.3 millimeters when we look at the monthly averages of the data. And you can see that the systematics, even at this level, do exist in this time series, but that, that they're at the scale of sub-millimeter. Uh, and this, again, both in north and east. And understanding what these signals are telling us, even at this level, is one of the aims of um, the analysis that we do. We also have sites with a fair level of systematic error in them. These are the horizontal components again. And notice now the scale has gone to five millimeters or so. And the, um, uh, again, you see this. And you often see the uh, annual type signals coming in the data. So annual signals in here. And that's, there's also a fast earthquake here that occurred in 2008. Now, one of the characteristics that is important with sort of understanding this data, and you can uh, find this by essentially looking for uh, the uh, geodetic notes that are on the UNAVCO webpage, is we have stations and we look at their characteristics and we publish information about what we think has happened at those stations. This could be uh, related to earthquakes. It could be related to vegetation at sites. There's a whole host of different types of things that we see. So this is the analysis we're doing. And there becomes a quite a big distinction between the way we treat IGS products between the two groups. Since New Mexico Tech uses double difference processing and Central Washington uses PPP processing, that actually has a major impact. And this happened when we started to do what was called reprocessing one, uh, when we started to adopt the IGS 08 system. What we were trying to do is to have both New Mexico Tech and the, Central and the PPP solutions have the same scale. Prior to that, we'd had issues with IGS-05 because different phase center models was actually used by the two groups. But we had adopted using the same Antex file. And so we thought, and what we wanted to achieve was to have no scale difference between the two analyses. That worked out well for New Mexico Tech because the orbits that are generated in the reprocessing are done to the center of mass of the spacecraft. So you can change the antenna phase center model that you use with those orbits, and in a double different style of processing, that actually has a very, very small impact on your final result. In the PPP processing, where you are using the clocks at the same time, if you attempt to use the clocks that are derived from an earlier phase center model, which is what happens every time the IGS does reprocessing, the scale associated with that earlier system translates into your new system. And that, as I said, has a big impact on how we use IGS products. And essentially, because of that mapping of the scale from the previous system, we actually, for the Central Washington solution, use JPL orbits and clocks. And we need to wait for, IG, for JPL to reproduce the newest ITRF in their system. And we're waiting on that right now for ITRF 2014. So right now, the PBO processing for both centers is being done with the IGS-08 phase center model for the final solutions. For the rapids, is actually being done with IGS-14 because JPL currently produces IGS-14 rapid solutions, but IGS-08 final solutions. And they will switch the finals when they have done their all back reprocessing back to approximately 1996. And we're waiting for that to happen at the moment. So the IGS products that are actually used by New Mexico Tech um, are the SP3 files, the orbits. Uh, we actually refit them to the uh, Burn Ecom model to, uh, to, because of issues with interpolation at the edges. Um, and that's not a big issue. That fits very well. We use the TEC models that come from the, for the high and order atmospheric corrections. Uh, again, uh, when those aren't available, and that happens occasionally with the IGS product, uh, we fall back actually on using the JPL TEC files. We use the differential code biases for ambiguity resolution and both JPL and, Central Wash uh, and um, 
Uh, so that's used by New Mexico Tech. Uh, the Central Washington group with the, um, uh, their processing uses the wide lane ambiguity files that are generated by JPL uh, to do the ambiguity resolution. So all the PPP is ambiguity resolved. Both groups use the same Antex file, which I must admit is a nice big improvement from uh, the IGS-05 uh, transition that had happened. Um, and both groups, we heavily rely on the ITRF in the initial parts of our processing as we go across. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that in a second. We don't use any loading files, and we, don't do, and we do that so that we remain consistent with the standards of the IGS. And that, again, is something that is debating for atmospheric loading and for hydrologic loading. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that there's a large amount of signal associated with those. But again, people are interested in studying those processes. So it gets a little complicated if we remove that from that. And so in our next generation of this system, uh, we will probably have files which are available both with and without that applied to allow users to do it. So the um, PPP versus the network solutions. Uh, again, we have um, uh, typically 1,800 stations being used each day. And, um, and so that's uh, spread across North America. The next figure will show that. Um, in the PPP processing, of course, each station is processed separately. In the double difference network processing, they are actually done in groups of typically 50 to 60 stations, which are then merged together into a single network. The critical thing in this type of processing is that the correlations um, in the network solutions uh, lead to estimates, which when you combine with the PPP solution, the PPP solution dominates the scale estimates if you decide to do it. And that's because of the lack of correlation in the PPP solutions. And this is something which I think we want to think about as time goes on, is when you're doing network averaged quantities that you have to start worrying that you're neglecting a large amount of the correlation when you do that. This is a typical network that we use. There's actually red and blue dots on that figure. Um, and the blue dots are actually the reference frame stations that we align to. One of the things we do with, PP, with the uh, PBO processing is we try to define the reference frame as widely across the whole network as we can. And we try to have it uniformly distributed in Latin long for where we actually have stations. And so you can see we don't have many stations in Canada that are available for processing. So it's dominated by the US. It's getting more dense now down in Mexico and up in Alaska is uh, as dense as it's going to get. So we use a large number of stations. That gives us a lot of redundancy as we go through. Now, the scale estimates that we have, this is the estimates running from 1996 through until 2015 approximately. The red dots at the top uh, the solution from New Mexico Tech with the double difference solution. The blue is the central Washington solution, and black is the combined solution. And so what you see in the bottom here is the differences between those, and the New Mexico Tech has larger RMS relative to the combined, and you'll see the combined basically is dominated by the PPP solution, and there is this somewhat long wavelength systematic going on uh, that we actually don't fully understand why it's arising there, but we think, again, that is partly related to the regional nature of the network as we go through. Now, if we actually compare the scale estimates that we get from this network with the scale estimates that actually comes from the global IGS network, what you see is that they're actually very highly correlated. And in fact, we have, I'll show you a spectra of this a little bit later, it is somewhat larger for the, New Mexico, for the PBO solution, but that is probably expected. The global IGS scale sorry, is based on the whole world, but the land-based stations in the IGS are dominated in the Northern Hemisphere, and we believe most of the signal is a Northern Hemisphere loading phenomena. In the Southern Hemisphere, when the loads would be disappearing, there just isn't as much land mass down there for those stations to affect it. Even when you divide the network equally by numbers of stations, you have less hydrologic loading in the southern hemisphere, particularly in the southern part, and we think that's what's driving this whole process. We can see the impact of this on individual stations, and so you can see at the top is the um, PBO uh, processing done in this North America fixed reference frame that we use, and then in the bottom is the UNR solution, which is another one that Jeff makes available, which is a very, very great resource. It's done in IGS-08. Those are actually quite highly correlated. But this, and that's the JPL IGS-08 solution in here. 
And then when you work in a North America fixed frame only, such as the UNR NA12 system, the, and you've estimated scale, you'd flatten that out. And if we take the PBO results and estimate scale across the whole of North America, we flatten out that systematic sort of annual signal you see there. We believe that is actually signal due to loading and that if you're aware that that's what you've taken out, that's fine, but some people aren't necessarily aware they've actually taken that out in the scale estimates as they go through. Now that issue with the noise in the uh, height estimates, this is an example of the covariance matrix for heights across the whole of the PBO network for the 1800 stations that we have. And so as you go down, you can actually see the subnetting work done in here. You can see that little bit of green going off here. Correlation here goes from zero up to 60 odd percent. It is all positive. There is actually negative correlations, but they're small. And what you see is this highly elevated area of you know, 10 to 20 percent correlations. When we combine the diff double difference solution with a global solution, but just the stations in the common region. So this is not actually a full global combination. It's just taking the stations from the global solution. All of those high correlations are reduced dramatically. And that's what we're trying to work out how to parameterize for PPP style solutions to give you a way to essentially re-add back in that correlation that might exist in there. Now, it does not sound like very much. If I cut just a profile across one station in here between those two styles of solutions, you see that this blue level of correlation, that's in the pure network. It's at, on average about 6%. We add in the global stations and that drops down to about uh, a few percent as we go across. What's interesting when you have these large numbers of stations is that the basic formula for the impact of common quantities here is going to go as the square root of your sort of standard deviation by the number of stations by one plus the number of stations by the correlations. And what that says is that this tiny level of about 6% correlation, that causes an increase in your scale estimate uncertainty from about 0.06 that you get from the PPP solutions up to about 0.24. It's a factor of four. And it's not dissimilar, in a sense, to the temporal correlations that people now take into account when they're trying to compute velocities with realistic uncertainties. You do need to start thinking about the spatial correlations when you start computing networked averaged quantities as we go through. So that impact of adding that scale is again down here is the original brown curve you saw earlier on. Uh, and if I take the network solution now, add in just the stations from the global network that are common to the uh, regional network, which is not very many stations, about 30 or 40, then it drops down to that black line. And so it does dramatically improve the system. If we look at the spectra of the scale estimates that we're seeing, then this is a function of time. What is interesting, this is in heights again. And again, scale and height are synonymous with each other when you take average, because we're basically a spherical planet. And you'll see globally, we have about a two millimeter annual height average as we go across. In PBO itself, it's about 2.5. In this spectra as a function of period down here, there are green lines, which are a little difficult to see. They're at annual and its harmonics. And there are red lines, which are at draconitic and its harmonics. And draconitic is the period of the satellite orbit relative to the sun. And this spectral peak, when you look at it, is if we zoom in on it, that is definitely um, at the annual frequency. When we go to the semi-annual, what's interesting is in our global IGS solution, that also seems to be a harmonic of the annual period, but in the PBO processing, it seems to be coming in at a uh, period closer to the draconitic periods. So this is the draconitic coming through the PPP orbits and clocks, which seem to be making it their way into the system. And as we go to the uh, tri frequencies, et cetera, those spectral lines line up. But this has been commonly noted that you do see these spectral lines appearing at these frequencies related to the draconitic and one of the things, again, that we would like to be able to do is to improve the separation of these terms in these regional network processings. So in summary here, the, uh, we've had a look at the review of how the plate boundary observatory works. Those processing methods used with Gamut with its double differencing and Central Washington with the PPP type solutions 
We do need the ITRF. The way we use it in the PBO processing is we start with currently IGSO 8. We define the North America fixed reference frame using the IGSO 8 Euler pole. And that is in North America approximately 20 odd stations we can use. We align the system to those 20 odd stations. And from that, we then get the velocities and positions of all 1800 stations. And so our day-to-day -day realization of the frame is based on our own realization of the reference frame with using, 15, with using about 500 stations. About once per year, we recombine everything in much the same way as the ITRF is created to redefine that reference frame based from the original covariance matrix solutions. That is a fairly long running solution when we do it. And then each month, we actually update the reference frame, but based on time series analysis as we go through. Impact of scale changes, we think, is something that people need to think about when they're doing regional processing. And importantly, the new use of an IGS product that we're not doing yet, but we are planning to implement soon, is the use of the Sinex files from the combined solution as a way of stabilizing network-generated uh, solutions with double differencing. Uh, that might actually only need to be done for the next year or so because we think the PBO processing might be actually going to uh, PPP for all systems in the next uh, few years. And at that point, we need to take into account spatial correlations and reviews in that paper. Thank you. <laughs>